So I'm Caleb Seifer, and I'm a clinical psychologist. And I'm going to talk a little bit about feeling bad better <clears throat> is a secret to actually living good. So I'm going to give one very concrete piece of advice that's very actionable today. But I'm also going to talk a bit about the big picture. And to get to my concrete advice, I need to get to the big picture. <laughs> the big picture is, why do people go to therapy in the first place? Um, well, when folks walk through my office door, they say a lot of things to me, but I can boil it down to, they say, doctor, I want a good life. And why I'm here is I don't feel good. And I know that feeling good is an important part of a good life. And folks, I'm here to tell you, they're not wrong. At the same time, if, when you live in a Western culture, one message that you're uh, exposed to frequently, for many reasons I'm not going to get into, is not just that you can feel good, but you should feel good, because you can always feel good all the time. If you're not currently feeling good, you're doing something wrong. And this suggests to people that a life without stress is possible. But I'm here to tell you a life without stress would be horrible, because that would be a meaningless life. So when people walk through my door, a part of what they're saying is true. They do need to learn how to feel good. As they start to let go of this idea that they always can feel good, they can start to ask a new question, which is, how can I feel bad better? Which is a question that many of us don't ask. OK, one way that we can feel bad is stress. Stress researchers will tell you stress involves a combination of thoughts, feelings, physiological states, and behaviors. Now, when it comes to the kind of stresses our ancestors face, and sometimes we face when walking in the woods like a bear, uh, this system works phenomenally well. And so what will happen is when you see a bear, you will think, I'm in danger. Um, you will think, you will feel a lot of tension in your body, and you will uh, want to get out of the situation. And all this is highly adaptive, and that's what our stress system is designed to do, and it does this very well. But when you're dealing with modern day stressors, like exams, like having to grade, like ongoing stressors such as financial difficulties or what we've all been through recently, the pandemic, this system is not ideal. Yeah. It will flood you with stress hormones and often there is no reaction that you can take to make this go away. Therapists working with people in these types of situations are going to focus exactly as was stated earlier and exactly as the student said on behavioral responses that will help people cope. When you come to therapy with ongoing stressors, we're going to push you to identify resources in your life that can help you. We're going to work with you on, on basic self-care. Are you exercising? Are you dieting? And absolutely, we're going to, as Grace discussed, we're going to talk about how can you use mindfulness and how can you use social support to help you. Now, even though I'm going to focus more on your thinking today, I want to make crystal clear that a lot of other people are going to focus on this, and this is necessary. Research will show you that people who do more of these things, especially when exposed to stressors, will have less stress hormones in their system and will cope more adaptively. However, our thoughts matter. Our thoughts matter. The brain is developed to tell stories. It does many things, but one of the things it's adapted to do is to explain things. If you are in a culture that tells you you should feel good all the time and you're currently feeling stressed, your brain has to tell you a story about why that is. And that story for a lot of people goes like this. I'm stressed because I'm failing. And I'm failing because I'm incapable. And the situation I'm in is bigger than me and I cannot manage it. And that means I'm in tremendous danger. And when we think about our stress this way, it amplifies our stress response. This is Richard Lazarus. If you want to know more about the research in this area, please email me. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Dr. Lazarus and his colleague Susan Folkman did an experiment where they put you in a stressful situation and they asked you to think about how this is dangerous to you. And what they found is when people did that, they coped more poorly, they released more stress hormones, they had more inflammation in their body, and they felt worse. But they also had people look at their stress as not danger but discomfort, opportunities for growth. When people referred to their stress as a challenge, they managed better. When they saw opportunities in it, they managed better. But we have to be very careful at this point. I started this talk by saying, feel bad better. And you might have just mistakenly heard me say, just think happy thoughts about your stress, and it all goes away. So 
instead, I'm going to suggest that we don't try to make our stress go away. Instead, we embrace behavioral strategies, but to get ourselves to initiate them, often students know what to do. You, you saw the video. But initiating it is a whole different matter. And sometimes how we can initiate it is we can use an and statement. And statements acknowledge bad feelings is real. They recognize that feeling bad can say something good about ourselves or about our life. And finally, they accept that feelings aren't either or. You can feel good and bad at the same time. When students graduate, they regularly experience this. I want to give you some examples of and statements that um, apply to what I'm going through right now. So what I have here is examples of stress statements that I experienced today and one from the past, and then how I try to use and to deal with it. The first one is, I'm anxious about this presentation and worry about how I'll be evaluated. And that's absolutely true. <clears throat> and at the same time, a part of what this reflects is I care about what my colleagues think about me because I'm fortunate enough to work with colleagues that I respect and not everybody has that opportunity. I'm also nervous that I won't have the impact I want and later I'll feel like I've failed or I've let myself down. And at the same time, tolerating that allows me to, it puts me in touch with I care about people and accepting that I might fail is an opportunity to practice you might not be able to help every moment, but maybe you can help someone. When I was a student, I wanted to say at least one from a student perspective, I often felt on edge and like I didn't know how to write the papers. When students are experiencing this, something that they can say to themselves is, and part of why this is stressful to me is I'm pushing myself out of my comfort zone in college. And this is an opportunity, whether I succeed or fail, to get some feedback and to grow. The stress is temporary. The growth could be permanent. To sum up, the desire for a good life requires us to learn how to feel good, and it requires us to learn how to feel bad better. In order to feel bad better, you absolutely need to use the type of behavioral techniques that a lot of other folks are going to focus on today. At the same time, using and statements and reframing your situation can get you to initiate those techniques. And statements will not take away bad feelings, but they will provide one avenue through which you might be able to feel better about the bad feelings that you have. Thank you, hope this has been helpful.